Hello, and welcome to Kroll Security Concepts Podcast, the podcast where Kroll security experts discuss the more prevalent topics in today's risk environment. The topic for today's discussion is one that we are receiving regular questions about, and that is what advice do we provide to companies when it comes to operating during times of great social unrest? Today, we have two guests on to discuss this topic, Daniel Linsky and Matthew Dumpert. Daniel Linsky is a managing director in Kroll's security risk management practice and head of our Boston office. As the former superintendent in chief of the Boston Police Department and a 27-year veteran of the force, Dan provided strong leadership through some of the most tragic and contentious events in the city's history, including the Boston Marathon bombings and the Occupy movement. Matt joined Kroll over three years ago after a distinguished career as a special agent with the U.S. Department of State. Matt was often stationed abroad at U.S. embassies working on federal investigations, the protection of overseas missions, and threat management that may arise in those areas. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Jeff. Danny, Jeff, nice to talk with you. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have both of you on the podcast today. I think your backgrounds in public safety and threat management are perfect for the pressing concern of many businesses today. Let's start with a big question. Are there any key pointers based upon your decades of experience, that you would give to businesses as they work to ensure the safety of their facilities and personnel in these times? Yeah, Jeff, you know, uh, really here, preparation is key. Uh, Like in so many things, safety and security related, the time for planning, uh, the time to have the discussion about civil unrest, about uh, protest activity, about you know, potential threats to your people and your business, the time to plan for that and the time for those discussions isn't when you're in an elevated threat environment. It's not when, uh, you know, your people are being threatened. It's not when your facility is surrounded. It's not when your neighborhood is inundated with civil unrest. You don't want to be thinking about this for the first time when tensions are high. You want to go into these uh, types of incidences with with well thought out plans. Have a plan for if civil unrest manifests in your neighborhood, if you or your business uh, is targeted, if your people are involved, or if your brand is invoked in, in in controversial ways. And you know this typically involves a multidisciplinary team. This is not a siloed issue for security. This involves uh, human resources, legal, marketing, public relations, risk management, insurance, and you know the list goes on. This is this is a, a an important topic that should be talked about ahead of time. The plan should be practiced. You know, then if your business is impacted, you have an airtight, well thought out, well practiced plan on how to deal with the litany of issues that surround civil unrest. Uh, Danny, is there anything from your experience as running a large uh, metropolitan police department that you would be able to give as advice to businesses? That's right on point. You have to train and prepare for the crisis before it comes to the door. You can't make those decisions that day. Now, it's not about having a perfect plan because you're never going to be able to prepare for every circumstance, every condition. But because you go through the exercise and you think and you plan and you involve your team, right? Planning can't just be the top comes up with what things are going to occur during a crisis. It should be the people who are actually on the ground charged with implementing a responses that should be part of that planning process and part of that exercise team. And going through and developing and walking through exercises and seeing and drilling is is imperative. And that way, when the challenge comes your way, if there are changes to it and and things that you have to bring into uh, your thought consideration, you can you can do that easily because you already have a, a system in place that, for the most part, has a response mechanism that's programmed and ready to go. Okay. Now, when businesses ask you the question, I mean, what do we provide to our employees to help them be prepared if they are to walk into a situation that they're not, uh, you know, typically involved with as a part of their business? Uh, what kind of advice can we give those businesses? Well, first, I have to make sure that my company, my my agency, my organization is involved in the information gathering business. We have to find out what's going on in and around us uh, that could be of concern for our our workers, our our employees, or our customers. Uh, Is there any civil unrest or disorder that's going on? Is there a uh, weather condition that's going to go on? Is there some challenge that impacts our team's safety and personal protection? Uh, 
How we're going to do that is we've got to be plugged in to the stakeholders around us, whether it's local government, municipal government, county government. We've got to be listening to the news feeds, the news sources. We've got to be engaging social media. And there are certainly numerous methods of technology that can alert you to challenges around you, whether that's an active shooter event, a protest, or an oncoming uh, cyclone or a weather condition. So having systems that can gather information and at the same time have the ability to get that information out to your employees and making sure that they're aware of what the neighborhood around them uh, can impact their commute to and from. Are there areas the police are concerned about where there's some disorder going on? Is there areas where there's been crime? Uh, as college universities do this all the time with the Clery Act, where they report on locations around their campuses where there are violence so that their students will know, even if they're not on campus and they're a couple blocks away, the types of challenges that may be in that area that they should be concerned for and preparing for. So getting, gathering, and evaluating information, and then disseminating it as wide as you can to the people in your organization is key. You know, Danny, those are excellent points. Uh, in those, in that same vein, with information gathering, particularly when we talk about civil unrest and protest activity, it's critically important to understand the background of the groups that are participating. And look, oftentimes, especially now, we see we see dozens and dozens of of groups and counter protest groups and advocacy groups uh, engaging in protest and civil unrest. It's important to understand who those groups are, and that takes a bit of sophistication and a bit of understanding and, and, and some specialized tools. But understanding who they are will help you understand whether they're predisposed to violence or whether they typically demonstrate peacefully uh, and and disband, uh, you know, appropriately. You know, the power of mob mentality is strong. What you don't want to do is have an employee uh, who's critical to your organization who has to commute to or from work. Uh, who has to either bypass or circumvent protest activity, they unintentionally or unknowingly get enveloped in it. Uh, and the power of mob mentality, like I said, is very strong. We want to understand who these groups are so that we can adequately prepare our personnel for what they're likely to see. Especially in recent months, we've seen an acute escalation happen very, very quickly in these protests where it goes from peaceful demonstration to extreme violence. And oftentimes we see that because of the participation of certain groups. I won't go into who they are now, but for each individual protest and, and, and for regional delineation, those, those groups differ. Matt, that's so true. That takes me back to the Occupy Boston protests in Boston. So people would be coming into work, commuting into work. They would have to get out of South Station, a huge metro rail hub, and they would have to walk by the Occupy Boston protest location. Some of them had corporate uniforms that they would wear to go to their jobs. And those particular companies had been identified by some of the protesters as people they were angry against for whatever reason. And there would be harassment and harangue going on as they were commuting to and from work. And you know, they have a right to commute to and from work, but it was us having a conversation with the management of that company to say, look, instead of having your employees wear their uniform to work, is it possible they could carry it in their backpack and change on premise? Or is it possible that when they come out of South Station, instead of walking by the encampment, that they go up one street and come around and walk a little bit out of the way, but that way they were avoiding the protests, especially when there's known tensions between your company, your employees, and the protest group that's making a stance. You know, Danny, those are all great points. We saw that, uh, you know, exactly that manifest overseas in some of my experiences as well, where you had a large group of of, of protesters or demonstrators uh, protesting peacefully. Uh, but then if if they recognize somebody who is affiliated, uh, in, in my experience, with, with U.S. government or friendly government elements, you know, they would then, you know, focus some of their ire on those individuals. Uh, and those individuals at the time may not have had the skills or the knowledge to deal and de-escalate. Um, you know, really, we need to safeguard our employees. And each protest, each geographic location, the exact address of your facility could change uh, the guidance that you give to your employees. The example of, of putting their uniform in their backpack is an excellent example of the little things that can safeguard our people. What we see, and I'll go back to that mob mentality because we've seen it uh, be harmful in so many cases, is it only takes a small number of individuals to incite an escalation in a crowd. And what you find is good people doing things they otherwise wouldn't. People who go to protests with good intentions, with the intention to remain peaceful, and then there's a there's a friction point or there's an escalation, and all of a sudden people who are who are otherwise good and law abiding engage in things that they otherwise wouldn't. So all excellent points, Danny. 
Yeah, I call that feeding the fire, Matt. And we see that in protests where once you see somebody start burning the first object, there's like a primal instinct that people feel like they've got to feed the campfire and they will start looking for other things to burn, even though that was never in their mindset going forward. And we have to talk to our clients who are running facilities. You know, people show up, they, they want to protest uh, and you find yourself with your lobby with, you know, 60 protesters with bullhorns screaming and yelling. You can talk with them, you can work with them, you can negotiate with them. You want to make sure you've got plans to try and contain them so they're not getting into your location. Make sure you're keeping your employees safe. But um, I remember uh, sometimes the best thing you can do is sometimes to ignore them. Time is on your side and is your friend. I, I had a protest at City Hall when I was in charge of security there, and I had 60 protesters, and at 5 o'clock, you know, City Hall's closed, and they're all trespassing. And there was a political leader there who was wanting me to put him in handcuffs and had brought three or four television crews with him. And at 5 p.m., he said, what are you going to do now? And I said, well, sir, the water fountain is over there and there's a restroom right down the hall for anyone. I turned the lights off and left. Uh, and they were dumbfounded. They, what do you mean you're not going to arrest us? And they wanted that shot that would embarrass. At that point, it was the government. It was the administration of the city they were trying to embarrass. Uh, and, and we didn't give it to them. And Oftentimes, if we're patient and, and have plans in place and contingency plans, sometimes allowing protest and, and letting them go on, uh, it burns out, the energy leaves, and they go on without any violence, without any further altercation. Yeah, Danny, I think that that really requires a, 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 a honed experience and set of skills. That, that's something that, you know, if an organization has that uh, organically within their ranks, that's excellent. And somebody who has those capabilities to maintain a cool mind, to operate well under pressure, to engage uh, with people and with groups uh, who are in direct opposition. Um, you know, I, I urge people, if you can identify somebody within your ranks, uh, they might be uh, the, the, the forefront. They might be the lead person to engage with protest groups or with uh, demonstrators, but it's critically important that that person really have those skills. Um, and if you don't have that within your organization, you should be looking for help. Um, you know, someone on call, someone on retainer that can come in and help you manage these situations because that type of patience um, takes a really honed uh, skill and acumen. As it comes down to, you know, what we're finding with our work that we're doing with our clients, do you guys have any takeaways from specific cases that you guys have worked where we've had to deal with businesses trying to respond after the fact, after they've already got themselves in the middle of a uh, protest situation and caused them a lot of issues? Fortunately for me, Jeff, a lot of our clients have been forward thinking and have brought us in and others in to do work beforehand to help them with the training and preparation. And calling us ahead of time, you know, as you well know, we've got a large executive protection team that goes global. Uh, and calling us ahead of time saying, you know, we hear from the local authorities that this particular challenge is going to go on in and around our facility. We're wondering what your thoughts are. And we've been able to help them figure out, do they, you know, change your access control programs? Do they staff up their security? Is that a visible security presence? Is it an, uh, a plainclothes security presence? Is there information they can give to their employees? Is there remote work conditions that can be set up so that people aren't coming into the plant or the facility? So most of the time, we've been able to deal with it proactively. Um, when clients have gotten into problems, for me, most of the time, that's been brand damage, where uh, they didn't realize that something was going on. Uh, they were being targeted uh, by, by groups that were protesting something. And by the time they realized it, it was already going viral and it was too late. And then you're trying to put the genie back in the bottle. So, um, you know, I, I can tell you, uh, getting out, especially if there's a, a media issue and a, and a brand reputational issue, getting out in front of it, especially if you've made a mistake and saying, look, we're sorry that happened. We own the mistake and here's what we're going to do to fix it. If people realize that your you know, companies are human like people are human, that they're going to make mistakes uh, and they own them, they're more forgiving and they're m less likely to engage in violence and, and continued brand reputational harm. Uh, than, than folks who, you know, are, are just not uh, doing anything, sticking your head in the sand and uh, sticking their finger in the wind and hoping it's going to work out that way. You know, the cases that I'm brought into, whether there are preventative planning or reactionary after an incident has taken place, 
You know, I'm really inspired. Uh, most of our clients, if not all, uh, their biggest concerns are the threats to their people. And when you take those preventative steps that Danny talked about, when we have a plan, when we discuss these things and we have physical, technical and operational security elements all working in concert, you know, the byproduct of that is that people feel better taken care of, their morale increases and productivity increases. So I'm really inspired by the way that many of our clients, whether it's in the prior preventative planning phase or in the aftermath of an incident, I'm inspired by the fact that they focus on people first. So I, I agree with you. Our, our clients have been phenomenal uh, and their safety and security teams have been phenomenal at making sure people feel comfortable, oftentimes going above and beyond what they need to do. And unfortunately, clients who don't do that uh, are the ones who wind up with problems that play out in the front page of newspapers and, and on 24-hour TV cycles across the globe because they're uh, not thinking about people. And if people feel that you have their health, safety, and wellness in uh, confidence and care, they will uh, uh, support you more uh, as you move forward through these issues. I couldn't agree with you more, Danny. Excellent points, gentlemen. I want to thank both of you for joining us on the podcast. I know you have very busy schedules these days. I want to thank all the listeners for tuning in. We hope to see you all next week. Thank you.